Clarissa Isabel Liboro Delgado, co-founder and CEO of Teach for the Philippines, has always been grateful to be born Filipina. This, combined with her steadfast belief in the values of learning, simplicity, and stewardship, has led her to where she is now. Clarissa started her career in research and impact measurement. From 2009 to 2011, she managed a randomized controlled trial for the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab for Saaklat Sisikat Foundation, or SAS. SAS created a 30-day reading program, which was proven by the Action Lab to have significant positive impact on the functional literacy of participating students, with the positive effects persisting six months up to a year after the intervention. In 2012, Teach for the Philippines was founded to expand the impact of SAS, a way to better address the broader twin challenges in quality of teaching and system level change. The organization now recruits, trains, and individually coaches new and tenured public school teachers over the course of two years in order to reinforce trust in public institutions, a key factor to inclusive change. They also provide TFP-trained teachers an avenue to engage in public policy. Aside from inspiring students to reach their full potential, TFP-trained teachers are also catalysts for change in communities across the Philippines. She's here to talk about the transition and preparation in education for the better normal. May I invite Ms. Clarissa Delgado. Good morning, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, and it means a lot to me to, to spend my morning with you because FINMA, the FINMA Education Network with whom Teach for the Philippines is partnered with, PBED, uh, FINMA Scholars, and the Siklab Award uh, means a great deal to me. Uh, I think we are, we are one in the mission uh, to build this nation uh, together. And I think we've We've been, they've been, the whole FINMA group has been, and DLSU and Ateneo have all been such a big part of Teach for the Philippines' uh, journey to date. Um, we are proud allies of RRR or, or Sir Ramon, as you call him. And again, just we are one in the mission of being worthy stewards uh, for our country. Um, I have for you today a short presentation about our work as, as Mrs. Acuna intoned. And so um, if you'll just give me a second and I'd be happy to share it um, with you. Perfect. So Teach for the Philippines has been working in public education for over two decades. As Mrs. Acuna shared just now, we began our, our work as Sakla Sisika, a functional literacy program in thousands of schools all over our archipelago. In 2012, after a successful measurement survey, we realized that the, pro the challenges really that faced our education system of 27 million learners, 1 million uh, teachers and administrators uh, were really systemic. And so from a 30 day reading intervention, uh, we became a three pronged organization that worked at every level of the education system to help um, support and, and, um, and commit to education quality in our nation. You heard earlier from Ambassador Laura Del Rosario and she had mentioned that education was struggling already pre-COVID and, and what more now, right? Uh, under the current pandemic. And so to speak to that, I just wanted to share with you the results of the 2018 uh, PISA, which is essentially just in short um, a, survey or assessment that is spearheaded by the OECD group of nations that enables them to compare and contrast their public education systems, uh, apples to apples. Now, obviously it's not perfect and there are no doubt many areas for it to improve, but it is significantly, um, uh, you know, one of the preeminent measures to compare public education systems. And it's also the first time the Philippines participated. In 2019, in December, the results came out 
And the Philippines actually placed 75 out of the 75 nations that participated. And, and, and again, the timeline for this is this was before COVID. This was before all of the, all of the disruptions that we've had to face-to-face -face learning. How does Teach for the Philippines engage uh, with the system? So just to, to just sum up our work, we have three programs. Uh, we work predominantly with public school teachers. We both look for new teachers. And in this, we actually partner with the FINMA Education Network um, and, and, and work with their school in Pangasinan, uh, the University of Pangasinan. And uh, we, we look for new teachers, but then we also work with tenured uh, government teachers. So if in any given year, in any given typical year, we have about a hundred teachers that we manage. Um, some of them will have zero to one to two years experience um, and come from a variety of backgrounds. So some are business, um, business honors, business management, economics, a lot of STEM, chemistry, mathematics. And then we also have another portion of our teachers who have anywhere between seven to 20 years of experience. Uh, and we believe that bringing those, both those cohorts together is really important in generating dialogue and, and learning. Uh, that is both the wisdom from those that have been teaching for a while, as well as the energy and drive of those that are recommitting uh, or committing and helping others recommit uh, to our children, to our students. In the long term, our long term goal, we channel um, some of our teachers, uh, those that are interested to work in the government into um, into technical assistant positions in, in various local and national governments, especially uh, positions or, or individuals that are working in education and youth policy. And in that we try to also be a support system for the administrators uh, that are behind the scenes administering our education system both inside and outside of DepEd and CHED. And this is important because you need both. You need both strong administrators as, strong, as well as strong instructional leaders in order to really change the narrative of education quality in our country. I'm just very quickly going to talk a little bit. Um, uh, and, and, and again, I'm presenting to a research conference. So it's important that I just make sure that um, what I share with you is backed up by data. So recently, we've been able to get the um, results of, of some of our baseline and post and post tests from just the past year. Uh, we're running this again this year. But in general, uh, we've found that on average, our students over 50%, almost 60% of our students are able to grow reading letter levels um, with our program, with our focus on functional literacy. We also work on life skills. Um, so in sum, I think if you think about Teach for the Philippines and what we do with our teachers, so how do you aid them, uh, both for the new and old teachers. Our specialties are really uh, literacy and numeracy, as well as life skills. And we work predominantly in the basic education system to build the foundations for all Filipino learners, as well as strengthen the professional development of teachers. Um, and specifically, we focus on numeracy literacy, which as you saw on the slide previous, um, making significant gains, and then also focusing on life skills. And I'll talk a little bit later um, or happy to answer in the Q&A how this focus has like actually on life skills has like actually become even more important under under COVID uh, and, and also our work with parents, right? So part of our, par our work in life skills involves parents and in COVID conditions, this has become um, exceedingly important uh, to the success of our program. In terms of data points for our alumni, as I mentioned to you, we have a third program that works in um, supporting administrators and about 71% of our alumni remain engaged in education even after their commitment with us. Uh, so 60% of them actually are all in, in, in the ambassadors program and then about half or more of those will actually join government full time. And so we're very happy to see that because you know, as, as RRR was talking about the importance of voting and our civic responsibilities, it's also really important to understand that we have to build trust in our institutions um, in order for our society to succeed. So the conference is called, you know, Education in this New Normal and, and how have we been pivoting uh, towards it. So in general, um, in, Dece in, in December, um, the Department of Education, after making significant gains in access, so access in education talks about ability of a student to reach the school, do we have enough classrooms, do we have enough chairs? Overall, even though obviously there are gaps that get talked about a lot, um, 
overall, since the creation of the public school system in 1901 and 1902 um, by the Americans all the way to 2019, significant gains have been made in education access. Um, under the Spanish, less than 12% of Filipinos were getting an education, and most of this was parochial and through um, religious groups. Under the Americans, only about 20% uh, of Filipinos were enrolled um, in public education. And we've really spent the better part of a century making sure that we have a close to 90% of an enrollment rate of Filipinos, and that anybody that wanted to get to a school or go to school in general um, has a much better chance of that being real now um, than ever before in the history of Philippine public education. Um, so after about a century of, of working on access, in 2019, because of the PISA results that I mentioned earlier, the Department of Education was ready and, and interested in, in, in pivoting to focus on education quality which was absolutely critical um, to obviously the work of Teach for the Philippines. We've been working in education quality for two decades. And so all of us were um, absolutely thrilled and, and very, very supportive of the pivot to Sulong Educalidad. Um, and again, as it is with change, you can't do all these changes all at once. It needed a century of focus on access in order to be ready to focus on quality. However, um, as you all already know, and we're speaking eight months after the fact, 11 months technically after the announcement of ed, uh, Sulong Educalidad, um, a pandemic, a global pandemic that nobody predicted and nobody could have predicted um, uh, came to the fore that has essentially um, taken us back about 50 years in access. We're again talking about can students um, get to school? Do they have the ability to um, learn uh, how do they have the tools that they need um, and and so it's it's a bit like one step forward yet having to take two steps back through no fault of any single individual nonetheless uh, the department of education has created a four-pronged uh, strategy to address covid um, essentially they break it down uh, to those students that have access to online uh, tools or access to the internet as well as the as well as this hardware and they are able to um, access education through digital platforms there is also a group of students with no access to connection or or hardware and they instead get um, uh, education through printed modules as well as distance learning Teach for the Philippines has um, pivoted to align itself completely uh, with the Department of Education's four-pronged strategy. I'll speak a little bit about this in the succeeding slides, um, but also still with our commitment to making sure that whatever and however we teach, uh, we are focused 100% on quality and that we are measuring ourselves to be accountable uh, to the learning of our students uh, and the students that we reach. In addition, um, and I think this is an important point that again I will return to because I speak specifically to an audience of masteral candidates and research students, I think it was really important um, to, to our organization uh, that we did not get distracted um, and uh, persuaded to focus on activity over results. And, and what I mean by that is that there's always, always, and it doesn't matter if it's a pandemic, but always a lot of noise and a lot of flashbangs about what, you know, um, what style or what type or what kind of education, et cetera. And I think for Teach for the Philippines, we've really found our way um, by sticking to our roots of being a measured and quality education quality organization and and focusing on on um, two things which is steady uh, commitment to to results um, as well as not making any assumptions and so the first thing we did apart from immediate consultation with the department of education through the education forum uh, that they created um, is we ran uh, rapid uh, rapid surveys, rapid assessment surveys across all the all the levels of stakeholders that we reach, whether it be parents, guardians, students, co-teachers, principals, administrators, local government officials, to actually understand um, what they did and did not have access to, how COVID had affected their um, income, a, a variety of data points that we did not want to make an assumption about. 
because of the results of our rapid assessment surveys um, and our deepening, I wouldn't say it's perfect, but we have a better picture um, uh, of what actually is happening on a micro scale. Uh, we made the decision to physically deploy our new teachers and to continue supporting our tenured teachers um, where they were in their placements. And this was it at the height of all of the quarantines and the lockdowns. And so we just made a commitment that now more than ever, our work was important that actually given um, the feedback we received on our survey, digital learning was going to serve a, a minority of our students and not the majority. And so we needed to um, both service the minority that could, but also address what about the majority that couldn't. Um, and that in order to do that, we needed to be physically in our community. Physically deployment does not mean face-to-face -face teaching, but it does mean proximity. It does mean that we are on the ground, um, neighbors to our students and their teachers and their principals. And this helps us in parent engagement. This helps us in being able to support teachers. And this helps us in, in, in terms of secure resource mobilization um, all over our archipelago. I'm gonna pause here just a little bit on the slide. It's really more visual than it is verbal, um, but maybe it's something that professors in this, in the audience will, um, will appreciate. Just because um, we have moved into distance learning doesn't mean professors and teachers have no commute and therefore more time to, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, we find that teachers often now have even more work than ever before. And mind you, teachers, whether you're in private and public had a lot of work <laughs> before COVID. Um, and essentially teachers now have a lot more um, preparation to do uh, before their classes. And I think it 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 is easy to, underestimate um, the effort that educators have to go through now um, in order to deliver education. And, and I just um, wanna pause here and, and, and share that um, it's not just students that are having to pivot and get used to um, listening to their professors on a digital format if that's the way that's working and whether or not to turn off video it's and it's not just students that have a challenge with getting um, internet connectivity um, teachers themselves and educators themselves um, have gone through and are going through a lot and have more work than ever uh, in in terms of delivering education no matter what the modality whether it's distance or digital um, and so it's all of us together um, adjusting When asked how could the audience be of help uh, to the education sector, I actually think that you all play such an important role. I think education research is critical, thorough, um, rigorous, micro and macro research is absolutely critical um, uh, to all development um, programs and education programs. You cannot diagnose challenges um, properly without without a without understanding what's on the ground right it, you it, you need to you need to support the changes that that um that you would like to promote with data with an understanding of why um your proposal is going to make a difference and i think uh, more than ever especially now um it's important not to make assumptions and it's 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 absolutely um critical to go back to our communities and to our stakeholders and give them a chance to update our understandings and, um, and beliefs about what they're going through now with COVID. And then above all, the humility to listen to that and to either step back or step forward, depending on the results of this research. And so I think that the audience members here that are conducting research in all forms of development, um, as well as the, the FIDM Education Network who's very principle is creating scholars, uh, you know, uh, democratizing Filipino young brown scholars all over the Philippines um, is absolutely critical uh, to this effort and to the sustainability of the development sector. Um, it was important pre-COVID, it's going to be even more important post-COVID because there is the danger of assumptions and assumed beliefs, um, which may not end up, be, end up uh, being true in the end um, and need to be verified again. Um, 
for those that are interested, we actually have a COVID response fund that is that is specifically gathering um, funds for materials, etc., uh, for the schools that still need help. Um, but I was also asked to speak a little bit about the recent typhoons. Um, so as all of you know, and this is getting towards the end of my presentation, home-based learning is not immune from natural disasters. So even over and on top of a pandemic, um, we have natural calamities to contend with. The Teach for the Philippines, as I mentioned to you before, is a nationwide program. So we have communities all along the path of Raleigh and Ulysses. Um, on your screen, I'm just going, we're just highlighting the three that would come immediately to mind um, based on, 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 the, on the trajectory of both of those typhoons in Baras. Um, it took us four days to get in touch with our teachers. We, it's four sleepless nights of trying to call every single person um, uh, to understand how these communities were affected. Um, Baras is, is, is even more north and more east than, than Virac. Um, our teachers there are struggling with, with intermittent signal um, and, and no electricity, but are pursuing um, uh, the distribution of relief goods, the resource mobilization, enrolling students in the LIS, and, and continuing with module creation and module dissemination. Our schools in Oriental Mindoro were also affected. Um, luckily, the, the, the damage there, um, uh, there were no there were no reported um, deaths and the damage to the homes uh, for sure, but people are already beginning to rebuild and classes have resumed. And then also in Isabella, luckily our school was in a relatively safe area, um, but nonetheless, though they are teaching, they have obviously banded together to mobilize resources for the communities that were not so fortunate um, and, and, were, and were submerged. And just um, again, uh, just putting this out there uh, that if there was any interest in supporting, our teachers are on the ground. Um, as I mentioned, they're physically deployed, so they're physically there. Um, and they are mobilizing resources. And if you go to any of Teach for the Philippines' social media page, you'll see that we've consolidated all of the um, uh, initiatives of our teachers um, so that if any of you were interested, you could go directly there and know that whatever you send is actually going to a person that is living in that community um, and making sure that those that those those uh, donations are going exactly where they need to go in terms of helping the students, their co-teachers and their parents. And so that's, um, that's my presentation for you today, a little bit about the work uh, that we've been doing in Teach for the Philippines, a little bit about how both COVID and the typhoons have affected us. And again, a reiteration that we are so grateful um, to be here with you all today. We believe in the mission of La Salle and of, of, of FINMA and are one with you in being steward, stewards of our, of our great nation and, and um, padayon to all of us. Thank you so much for having me. for sharing with us your initiatives under Teach for the Philippines. Uh, please be on standby. Uh, we will have our question and answer portion later after our second speaker. So our next speaker is also an RBR Sick Lab 2019 awardee, recognized for helping local farmers and indigenous communities around the country to become more sustainable. In 2007, she organized Got Heart Foundation, a nonprofit one-stop shop featuring local and organic goods from farmers. She partnered with Hizon's Catering in 2013 to put up Earth Kitchen, a farm-to-table restaurant that serves healthy and organic dishes, and they prioritize the direct sourcing of their ingredients from partner communities. As our country faces the COVID-19 pandemic, she launched the Bunny Project to provide protective suits to medical workers and hospital personnel. At the end of May, they were able to distribute more than 30,000 protective suits, more than 250,000 masks, and about 10,000 face shields to hospitals and public health groups all over the country. What started as a simple PPE donation drive later on evolved and provided livelihood opportunities to over 200 seamstresses, PWDs, and youth groups. She's here to talk about the current initiatives and prospects in the new normal of the Got Heart Foundation and the, Mon and the Bunny Project. May I invite Ms. Melissa Yap.
Hi everyone, good morning. So I, I'd be sharing with you um, the, the things that we're doing to reimagine the new normal in this pandemic. Okay. All right, so business and management in the Philippines during times of uncertainty. Okay, so there's this um, Chinese saying that that says wait see so they look at crisis as so if you look if you read this text from left to right it's called weighty which means danger but if you read it from right to left it means opportunity or t way so it shows that in a crisis you can see there's you could either look at it as danger or you could either look at it also as an opportunity so there's danger and opportunity and opportunity and danger. Speaking from a personal experience, so here, these are some of the companies that thrive during financial crises. So Netflix, EA Sports, FedEx, Disney, those are, these are Microsoft, these are some of the companies that thrived in a time of pandemic. So on a personal note, I also experienced a personal crisis. So when I was 13, um, Hi, around high school, I was a soccer player, but I got injured. And then during that time of personal crisis and depression, I found my passion, which is art. So, and like fast forward to 2020, I'll be exhibiting in Manila art. So without, probably without having that personal crisis, I probably wouldn't be an artist right now. <clears throat> and also like another personal crisis came about when I was, uh, when I graduated from college and I didn't know what to do. So I decided to volunteer with different NGOs and also recognize that there's a huge crisis in the country in terms of how we treat our indigenous people, crisis in education, you know, and crisis in the quality of life of the people around us. And that was when I recognized my privilege as a person and what I'll do and what I'll do about it. So that enabled me to put up, um, it, it enabled me to have this mindset of thanksgiving, which is to give thanks by actually giving, to giving of my life. And that's how God, the God Heart Foundation came about. So it's now a group of social enterprises that work with the poorest of the poor, indigenous people, farmers, fishermen, people who got um, the, the vulnerable communities who got affected deeply by COVID and the typhoons. And that's where we, we work with like Marawi during the time of um, the siege. So that's when we, so out of that, those um, turbulent uh, situations of people emerged farming uh, projects and got heart, which is our shop that helps communities sell their produce. And now we're also developing different types of um, personal care products to process more of these natural produce that the communities have like VCO and honey, things like that. And then we had so much um, produce coming from the different communities that we decided to come up with a stable farmer supportive restaurant. So here, so it's undergoing its own personal, its own crisis now with, uh, with the effect of COVID in restaurants, but it's still happily alive and we still work with these communities, especially the PWD groups in Tarlac. So during times of pandemic, the opportunity that I could see is, is our privilege as people and our opportunity to use our lives to be a bridge that can help bring opportunities closer to those who need them the most. So that's when the Bunny Project also, with that mindset also was when the Bunny Project emerged. So if you remember around March, there was a huge PPE crisis in our country where there was a, such a huge shortage. So, so many of our doctor friends were desperately asking for help with their PPEs. And that was when we also looked around us and saw the, the vast resources that we have, which is human capacity to actually sew these PPEs and here we have a short video to show you about the bunny project. 
Like most great ideas, the Buddy Project was born out of need to help suit up our modern day heroes. A new idea, to give bunny suits as alternative protective gear for frontliners, doctor approved and also reusable. All around, people started to give their time, money, and effort. Bunny makers from Tarlac snipped and sewed day and night in their homes, doing meaningful work while providing for their families. With no time to waste, the bunny suits started hopping over to the frontliners. The fight is still on. And the only way we can win is if we do this together. Hop on! The Bunny Project needs you. Okay. So at the start of the pandemic, oops, sorry. Okay. So there. At the start of the pandemic, I was also like everybody feeling very hopeless and and anxious and depressed. But the Bunny Project, they, you know, if we all felt empowered, especially the men and I, they were they were so touching when they said that the doctors used to save their lives and now they get to save the doctors' lives. And it was such a touching project that we decided to continue it on even during um, the typhoons, so I'll talk about it later. So aside from the bunny project, the, the crisis also gave us an opportunity to reach out to more farmers who, who lost their outlets for their produce. So like all of these mangoes could have gone to waste if we weren't able to all help each other in directly linking them up to businesses like what Sir RR was talking about earlier. Linking with big businesses is also one way of helping out. So during this typhoon, the Tanging Yaman Foundation of Ateneo needed a lot of help with, with rice. So it also gave us an opportunity to work directly with farmers in sourcing rice for them. And for the farmers, the prices of uh, pala really went down. So we were able to negotiate a fair price for them. So it's been able to help the farmers, Ateneo, and the the people affected by the, by the typhoons. And during, during this season, the Manana is also batted together to make blankets for those who, who lost their homes. So these blankets are really huge so they can act like tents and um, floor covering and evacuation centers and also the dividers for their for the temporary homes. And also, uh, this pandemic also gave us uh, a lot of um, what's this motivation to really work on the, the dream projects that we have. So that's my son there. That's the factory that we just built during this pandemic. It's a factory that would process produce by the Aitas, the, the different Mabangyans, the different communities, our VCO community in, uh, in Maguindanao. So this will be a factory that would process all of those different items to be personal care products and another project that we're working on now is the industrial park to hopefully bring in locators and manufacturers because so many people lost their jobs in Tarlac alone there were 3,000 OFWs who had to come home because they lost their jobs abroad and those are just OFWs it doesn't include data on the farmers lost their jobs people lost their jobs in Manila and things like that so these are some of the things that we're also working on so in this pandemic you see so many opportunities to really use everything that you have as a person to just reach out to those who need them the most and help out and something that i tell people is that you shouldn't be afraid to share your time talent and blessings with others because if you can imagine how i was when i got injured from soccer till now it's such a big leap in and really seeing the grace of God working through us. And it's not because of me, it's because we just allow ourselves to be instruments of God, to share his blessings with others. Because, and, and by doing that, I, I could really attest that he can never ever be outdone in generosity. So don't be afraid. So here's our contact number in case you have questions. 
Yeah, thank you so much. that very insightful presentation. Uh, we are now in the uh, question and answer portion of our session. Uh, for those who are tuning in with us via Facebook Live, please send in your questions in the comment section. And for those in the Zoom video call with us, kindly forward your name, affiliation, and questions through the Q&A feature of Zoom. So Melissa and Clarissa is here. I think Clarissa was able to answer some of the questions via the Q&A uh, feature of Zoom. But we have here uh, a question from DLSU DBA student Chris Kiso. And his question is uh, about education in the next normal. In your opinion, how effective is our government responding in responding to cope with the new normal of education? Are there still opportunities where we can improve in terms of national policies and programs on education? Uh, maybe Clarissa can start. Sure, I'd be happy to. I think that in terms of effectivity, as with all things in education, that's still yet to be seen. Um, ultimately, this pandemic and this crisis, as well as the natural calamities, were completely unprecedented. So any idea that people could begin to prepare for this um, to begin with uh, would be a bit far-fetched. We <laughs> did, didn't see it coming, and, I, and I'd include myself there, that I didn't see COVID coming, right? Um, in terms of are there still opportunities where we can improve, from my experiences working with, for example, Undersecretary uh, Nepomusen Malaluan or with Director John Siena at the National Educators Academy of the Philippines, I think from my experience working with those professionals, they would be among the very first, or, 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 or USEC, even, even USEC Dada San Antonio in the Bureau of Curriculum, they would be among the very first to say that this is our plan. We have a four option strategy. This is the best idea that we have um, so far. But of course, that there are opportunities to improve, right? And I think that they're demonstrating this to us in, um, we, there was just a presentation made, um, oh, COVID, my time el eludes me, but I think this Monday morning, where uh, in that small group, the education forum, you know, USEC Nepo shared listen, like folks are sending feedback about our modules and we're receiving them and we're adjusting as we go along. Um, and so I really do think that they would be among the first to say that, of course, there are opportunities to improve in terms of policies and programs and that they're not perfect, um, but that it hasn't kept them from trying. Um, and I think that I appreciate um, a lot that that they, it hasn't kept the, the administrators and, and certainly not the principals from trying very hard to print these modules and get them to students. So I guess a roundabout way of saying, of, of course, there's where areas to improve and that nobody has a perfect answer, um, but nobody is also staying inert and not doing anything, if this makes any sense, Mrs. Acuna. All right, thank you, Clarissa. Uh, we have here a question for Melissa from Dr. Emmy Sariel. Uh, th thank you for sharing your wonderful experience as a social entrepreneur. Please give us some advice as faculty members on how to teach minds and touch the hearts of our students to be more mindful of the less fortunate plight. First of all, I'm really happy that there are professors who think that way, that see to it that it's an opportunity to, um, to do that. And also, um, in, in, when, with regards to helping students be more mindful, first is really to help them recognize their privilege and to transform that recognition into gratitude. And at the same time, also with the communities, like when we say that we're gonna help the poor, who's the poor? I mean, people need to have that personal connection and relationship with people that they wanna help. There has to be faces. Like when you talk about indigenous people, who are they? Like, like with the, with the blankets for the evacuation centers, people were asking me why 
why waterproof? Why is it that big? And as I said, I stayed in an evacuation center some years ago, and the ground was wet and cold, and the roof was dripping, and we needed some privacy. And so we, we need something like a bit bigger for the family to kind of have some, some sort of you know, security in this time. And that's how we design things by being with people. We don't go to communities starting with projects. We go there by listening to them first and getting to know them and having a real deep friendship with them. And that's, I think, that I think is something that goes beyond project management skills and everything like that. It really has to have, it really goes with like building relationship with the actual people that we want to help out. I know it's a bit tough now during this time of pandemic, but we really need all the more we need to reach out to them in the safest way possible, of course. But it has to be like a real relationship. If I can, um, uh, Melissa Cunha, I just 100% agree with Melissa. Um, first of all, I'm obviously Melissa and I are friends off cam, but I'm God Heart is incredible precisely for this commitment. Um, and as Melissa shared, um, it's so important not to make assumptions and to just come with your own projects and determine the blanket that people need or the bunny suit that people need without asking first um, how they're experiencing this. And then our rapid assessment survey, again, as Melissa shared, in Teach for the Philippines, we did the same thing. Um, but if obviously, in your pandemic, so what did that mean for us? You can't really travel unnecessarily, but you can call people, right? And you can get families and parents on the phone to really just spend time with them and deepen your relationship and ask them how they're doing, um, as well as how can we be of help to them. Um, and so just, you know, 100% supportive of, of Melissa's comment. It's, it's so true. Thanks, Clarissa, as always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both for answering that question. Okay, so I have here another question for Clarissa from Dr. Ben Tihanki of other Ramon B. De Lazario College of Business. Um, he's asking, what do you see as our priorities as educators and schools to prepare our students for the fourth industrial revolution where AI, robotics, big data, and 5G will be increasingly pervasive and jobs threatening? Oh, gosh. Um, really good question, sir, Tihanki. I mean, that's like a million-dollar question, right? I think... Um, I think not just students, I think all of us um, need to learn how to be students again. <laughs> so I think students have a one leg up on us because they're already just studying. But I think all of us, um, you know, uh, myself definitely included, need to understand um, like a liberating pedagogy, the, the love of learning, because I think that that's actually going to be critically important. I don't know what I don't know about AI and the fourth industrial revolution or how this is going to absolutely change economies, uh, jobs. Yet I do know that I need to be intellectually humble um, in the face of all of this and open to learning and hope that in modeling that it is okay then for my staff and then my teachers to also say when they don't know and be open to learning. So I think that's critical that we don't look at education as a static I am depositing this information for you forever kind of um, methodology, but instead look at it as um, liberating in some ways and getting into dialogue and discussing curiosity, as well as um, being upfront and honest about even things that the professor doesn't know and can we explore these together. And a lot of that is not so much about teaching, it's more modeling, right, um, to students. Um, that And then in terms of actual competencies and skills, Sir Tianqi, I mean, as an educator yourself, perhaps you know, an emphasis on critical thinking um, would be important because of all the data um, that's coming in and understanding how to distinguish um, real data from maybe less real or not, not fake data <laughs> um, would be um, super critical um, and something that you know, when I was going to school or et cetera, or having to go to libraries, there is a rigorous process to publishing right, into getting into publications. Um, and so you could almost be sure that if you picked up books and journal articles in the library that this has gone through several um, stages of, of academic um, review. Uh, with social media and, and the access, everything, there's nothing right or wrong with it. It's just simply that you can publish anything without it having going through academic review. And so now the responsibility is on the learner to be able to distinguish um, 
where he or she would like to learn from. And again, that goes back to critical thinking as well as um, love of learning and the willing to be and admit if you're wrong and if you um, picked something up but then decided later on that you actually learned something new and got more information and had to change your mind. Um, and so perhaps I would start there and just leave it at that, Professor Tihanki, only because I really don't know what I don't know. And honestly, something could happen tomorrow that would make any prediction I make on AI inconsequential. But if you go back to the basics, it's just nourishing um, the love for learning through modeling a methodology in which the teacher themselves is in love with the um, idea of learning and being wrong and finding out new. And then in terms of competencies, um, you know, critical thinking, which is the ability also to distinguish and, and think um, critically about what it is um, we're reading and learning. I hope that helps a little bit answer the question. That's very well said, Teresa. Thank you. Uh, we have here another question from this time from Dr. Ruth Cruz, Ruth Angeli Cruz. She says, thank you to Melissa for starting a chain of new ideas to address the lack of PPEs at the beginning of the pandemic. The idea for bunny suits came at the best time to address the emergency during uh, in March and April. Can you give a message to our students to encourage them to take part in being part of the solution, even as young students? Okay, so maybe I maybe I can share an experience I had when I was around 12, 13. Remember when they said I when I got injured, I went to I had an art workshop and I went to an orphanage also at that time. And I saw how the conditions of the, the kids are, there was a, this was in Santa Mesa. There's a railroad there with a lot of those shanties and I, the kids brought me to their houses. And that night I came home to my room with aircon, had my own TV and I was praying to God. I was looking at the ceiling. I could still remember the light in my ceiling. And I was asking God, why do I have all of these? And why don't they have any of these? What did I do to deserve this? And the answer I got was that nothing. You didn't do anything to deserve what you have. But since you do have all of those blessings, it's your job to share them with others and not just to hoard them. So from then on, when I was 13, I made a pact with God to use my life as an instrument for sharing. And then eventually, I learned like a more sustainable way of sharing through social entrepreneurship, something that wouldn't give me like donors fatigue and things like that. So, so maybe first is really to, to look at the things that they're grateful about their life. Can it, it can be material and immaterial things and see how... And see why God gave them those blessings. If you don't believe in God, maybe an, another being, or just maybe just realizing what you have around you, and see what what life is about. What life? What is life for? If you die tomorrow and you have all of those, did you really live a purposeful life or something like that? It's it's really recognizing what we're here for, and seeing what our purpose in life is, and maybe that can be a good start for for something. All right, actually for a, a follow-up question, this time from uh, Eric Parilla from the College of Business Education at Northwestern University. So how can we promote social enterprises in provinces like Ilocos Norte? Okay, that's, that's a really good question. And I've been thinking about how to really promote more products from, from um, farther communities. And I think this pandemic has kind of somewhat leveled up the playing field in terms of promoting in social media. I think right now social media has created like a free platform where people can really, of course, aside from the ads, you know, but in general, we can all still like promote things like the bunny project went viral without a single ad. And the same as the, the blanket project. And so that that went viral, like from the Zon to Mindanao, not a single ad. And it's just a free post. You know, when you genuinely care and you are able to kind of just really share your heart and and something that like an idea that you think would really help and you actually do something about it, people would naturally gravitate to that. So I think for Ilocos, you know, can you social media, maybe explain the situation of the people and maybe share their products 
and see and then listen to people's um, feedback on how they can improve their products and kind of fill in, help fill in the gaps, maybe on marketing or in delivery distribution or something like that. But I think social media is such an underutilized tool for social entrepreneurs that we can really maximize. So right now, even we're trying to, to learn on how to, you know, post better pictures, for example, of the products and things like that. It's a constant learning process that I think we all have access to. All right, so I think we have uh, time for just one more question and this is addressed to both Melissa and Clarissa. Okay, so this is from Dr. Oscar Bulao Jr. from Atenea de Manila University and he asks, uh, did your education have an impact on your social consciousness? Can you share an anecdote that tells us about that impact? Maybe we educators can replicate that in our present students. So maybe we can start with Clarissa first. Um, oh, education absolutely um, had uh, impact on me, both, and I look at education broadly, both in education that I received um, from formally from my schools, as well as informally at the dinner table with my grandparents and my parents. Um, and I think both of those were critical um, to my success. In terms of the actual question of um, how do we replicate this, I think what I took away from my schools was not so much um, the words or the slogans. I mean, I ended up memorizing those things um, because they're said often, but it was really more when I saw the professors, my professors and especially my school administrators up to the chancellors or the school heads um, living out the values of the school. And then using those teaching moments to say, we're making this decision because it's based on our value of this. So one example is I went to a public university um, and, and they're one of the oldest public universities in, in, in the United States. And so I went there um, and, and, I, and you know, I had asked a question to the president and I said, um, if you are the same age as Harvard, then why didn't you become private? Right. Um, it's a simple question, innocuous, ignorant, perhaps. Um, and, and, the, and the president just answered me and said, because we believe that education is a right for all. And it's really important that we live um, by that value and, 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 that, and that we are committed absolutely to remaining a public institution and accessible, very similar to what FINMA shared. And I think um, what the FINMA network of schools aims to do. And I think hearing that, um, you know, from someone so august and, and, and inspiring as, as, the, as the school head, um, help make that, that oft repeated phrase um, real for me. Um, in, terms of, in terms of what I learned at the family table, um, just very briefly, so um, both my grandparents were um, active in World War II. Um, my grandmother was the chief of a guerrilla unit as a medical doctor, then she then went on to become a cardiologist. My grandfather was a prisoner of war actually in Fort Santiago. I think if you have, and you're growing or up around stories like that um, at the dinner table, um, they don't really give you an inch uh, to um, shrink from your duties of being a participating Filipino citizen. Um, certainly if they were willing to fight so hard. Uh, for all of the liberties that I have an opportunity to, to have an opinion on right now, um, then by God, I definitely needed to find ways of being of service to the Filipino community. So again, just going back to stewardship. Um, and as, as Melissa said, this deep understanding that um, in many ways, each of us has a privilege of our own. Um, and how can we be responsible for that privilege and make sure that if we're able to cross this doorway of opportunity, any doorway of opportunity, that we hold it open for others to come through with us rather than slamming it shut um, behind us. And that's just really um, the principle by which um, no matter what it is we all do um, that I hope Filipinos commit to. Yeah. I really love the imagery you shared, Clarissa, with the daughter. It's beautiful. So in school, so when I was in Ica, we were taught to be men of women of faith and service. In Ateneo, it's men and women for others. In AIM, it's doing good while doing well. And in Harvard Business School, it's making decent profits decently. So all of those things really mean to me something what it means to me is that we work with ourselves 
and see how we can actually use ourselves as instruments to lift other people up. Or like with the, the imagery that Clarissa said, we open, we use ourselves to open the door, not just for ourselves, but for other people as well. And maybe the anecdote that I can share, um, my, my favorite teacher who wasn't formally my teacher is Father Ben of Ateneo. And he taught me by showing me how it's done. So he also works greatly with like, public school education and things like that. And I remember he drove, he's like 70 something, almost 80, I'm not sure, but he's on the older side. And he drove himself around seven public schools in one day. And it's in Nova Ecija, in really far public schools. And I was with him the whole time. I we were four, we, there were four other young people in the car. We were all exhausted. This is fashion, being there, listening to, and we were up aside, no munching on all the snacks that the public school teachers bought us. But that, that personal connection of being down there or being, you know, not being high up that you know he was the president of Ateneo but he was there with us getting his feet really the deep friendship and connection with people that made that allowed him to listen all right Mel, are you, are you still with us? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me or did I, did yes. I lag? Go ahead. Yeah. So it's the, the actual example that Father Ben showed me by being there in the community and really, you know, conversing with people and more, more importantly, listening to people, even though he was the president of Ateneo, he, he was there to listen. And that's how he crafted his project. So if the teachers show us how it's done by really, you know, walking their talk, I think that would that would make things easier for students to emulate. All right. So thank you very much for your very inspiring messages. Uh, so to Clarissa and Melissa, thank you, everyone. Uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, at this juncture, on behalf of the Organizing Committee of the 8th National Business and Management Conference, I would like to express our appreciation by presenting these digital certificates to Clarissa and Melissa. So the certificates of appreciation are awarded to Ms. Clarissa Delgado and Ms. Melissa Yap for facilitating the Capacity Building Webinar uh, during the 8th National Business and Management Conference held last November 27 to 28, 2020 via Zoom video conferencing. The theme of the conference is Reimagining the Next Normal, Business and Management in the Philippines During Times of Uncertainty. Signed, Dr. Emilino Sarial, Dr. Antonio Lopez, and Dr. Oscar Balaong Jr. So again, thank you very much, Clarissa and Melissa, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much.